Hello and welcome. I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. In today's episode, we'll go through the recommendations on H. pylori testing and treatment, focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. It is based on the NICE guideline on gastroesophageal reflux disease and dyspepsia and the quick reference guide on the subject by Public Health England. The links to them are in the episode description. Right, let's jump into it. What is Helicobacter pylori and why is it relevant? Helicobacter pylori, also commonly referred to as simply H. pylori, is a gram-negative bacterium that colonizes the human gastric mucosa. It's usually acquired in childhood and persists unless treated. Now, in terms of prevalence, we see big differences between developed and developing countries. In developing countries, prevalence can exceed 70 to 80 percent in adults, largely due to poor sanitation, crowded living conditions, and limited access to clean water. In contrast, in developed countries, the prevalence is much lower, usually around 20 to 40 percent, and continues to decline. Better hygiene, sanitation, and widespread antibiotic use are key reasons for this. Overall, socioeconomic status, living conditions and age are the main factors influencing prevalence. So why is H. pylori important? H. pylori plays a key role in the development of chronic gastritis and peptic ulcer disease and is a major risk factor for gastric adenocarcinoma and malt lymphoma. And this is how it works. H. pylori infection reduces mucosal defenses and increases gastric acid secretion, which together lead to ulcer formation, particularly in the stomach and duodenum. On top of that, the ongoing presence of the bacteria triggers a chronic inflammatory response that causes chronic gastritis. Chronic gastritis over time can progress to atrophic gastritis, then intestinal metaplasia, then dysplasia and eventually adenocarcinoma. Now let's look at MOLT lymphoma. MOLT stands for mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. H. pylori infection stimulates the development of this tissue in the stomach, which isn't normally there. The chronic stimulation by the bacteria drives B cell proliferation and can eventually lead to malignant transformation into low grade B cell lymphoma. Interestingly, in early stage malt lymphoma, H. pylori eradication alone can lead to regression of the lymphoma. That really highlights how central the bacterium is in the disease process. So, how do we test for H. pylori? The main options are the urea breast test and stool antigen test. There's also serology, though we are advised against using that routinely. The urea breath test is the most accurate, but it needs the prescription and staff time to carry it out, so it's not always practical in primary care. In most cases, we'll use a stool antigen test instead. We need to remember that recent or ongoing PPI use can reduce the bacterial load and increase the chance of a false negative result, particularly with breath and stool tests. So if the patient has been on a PPI, we should stop it and leave a two-week washout period before testing. The H. pylori serology test has a low cost, but also a lower accuracy, so it is not recommended for most patients, and positive results should be confirmed by a second test, such as a urea breath test or biopsy. H. pylori serology has very good negative predictive value in low prevalence developed countries, and it is most useful in patients with acute gastrointestinal bleed to confirm a negative urea breath test or stool antigen test when there's a possibility that blood and PPI use would make those test results unreliable. Serology testing detects IgG antibodies, so it does not differentiate active from past infection. Near patient H. pylori serology testing is not recommended and only locally validated laboratory-based serology tests are acceptable. Additionally, Public Health England states that we should not use serology testing post-eradication therapy or in children and the elderly. What does NICE say about when to test? H. pylori testing is addressed in two areas of the NICE guideline in uninvestigated and functional dyspepsia, and in peptic ulcer disease. 
Let's look at dyspepsia first. And to clarify, the term dyspepsia is used broadly in primary care. It includes recurrent epigastric pain, heartburn or acid reflux, with or without bloating, nausea and vomiting. For these patients, if there are no alarm symptoms, we follow a test and treat approach for H. pylori. But before we go any further, let's remind ourselves of the alarm symptoms and what to do if they're present. If someone presents with significant acute GI bleeding, we will refer them immediately to A&E. We will also refer under the suspected cancer pathway to exclude esophageal or stomach cancer if they have dysphagia or if they are aged 55 or over, have weight loss and also have either upper abdominal pain, reflux, dyspepsia or a mass suggesting stomach cancer. We should also consider direct access upper GI endoscopy, people of any age with history of hematemesis, or in people aged 55 and over with treatment resistant dyspepsia, or upper abdominal pain with low hemoglobin, or raised platelets with any upper GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, weight loss, reflux, dyspepsia, or upper abdominal pain, or nausea and vomiting with either weight loss reflux, dyspepsia or upper abdominal pain. But now let's go back to dyspepsia without alarm features. In these cases, we'll test for H. pylori. If a patient has already been prescribed a PPI, we'll stop it and wait at least two weeks before testing because, as we have said, PPIs can interfere with the test result. Once testing is done, we will offer a four-week course of a full dose of PPI for dyspepsia. If H. pylori is detected and eradication treatment given, we will not routinely retest in cases of functional dyspepsia. This is because 64% of patients with functional dyspepsia will have persistent recurrent symptoms, so retesting after eradication is not recommended. However, things are different in peptic ulcer disease. Here, we test for H. pylori, and if positive, we will treat it. But unlike with functional dyspepsia, we will retest after eradication therapy, usually six to eight weeks after starting treatment, depending on the size of the lesion. And while we usually do the initial test with a stool antigen test, when it comes to retesting, we should use urea breath tests instead. That's because there isn't enough evidence to support using the stool test to confirm successful eradication. So, in summary, NICE recommends testing for H. pylori in investigated dyspepsia and in peptic ulcer disease. Additionally, Public Health England adds that we could also test in other scenarios, like patients before taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, if they have a prior history of gastroduodenal ulcers or bleeds, as well as patients with unexplained iron deficiency anemia, after negative endoscopic investigation has excluded gastric and colonic malignancy and other investigations have excluded all other potential causes. Now that we know when to test for H. pylori, are there cases where we shouldn't routinely test? And the answer is yes. NICE doesn't recommend routine H. pylori testing in patients with proven esophagitis or with predominant symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux disease. Public Health England also advise against testing in children with functional dyspepsia. In these cases, if further assessment is needed, we should refer them to secondary care. So, what do we do with the test results? If the result is negative, we can reassure the patient. The negative predictive value of all tests is over 95%, especially in low prevalence settings like the UK. If the result is positive, we will offer eradication therapy. That means a seven-day, twice-daily course of a PPI plus two antibiotics. NICE recommends the following PPI doses twice a day for eradication therapy. Isomiprazole or rabiprazole, 20 mg omeprazole 20 or 40 mg, lansoprazole 30 mg and pantoprazole 40 mg. For first-line treatment, we combine the PPI with amoxicillin and either clarithromycin or metronidazole. 
If the patient is allergic to penicillin, we will use both clarithromycin and metronidazole. There are other regimens depending on whether the patient has had previous exposure to clarithromycin or metronidazole, whether they have penicillin allergy, and whether we're looking at first line or second line treatment. I will not go through all the different possible regimens as you can look at all the different possibilities in the NICE guideline on dyspepsia. I have also put all the recommended regimens in the episode description. If eradication therapy is not successful with second line treatment, we will seek advice from a gastroenterologist. So that is it, a review of the recommendations on H. pylori testing and treatment. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice, but only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching and goodbye.